Okay, I think it's maybe starting to level off, um, but you know, people can continue to to join us as they as they arrive. So welcome, bienvenidos. Before we begin the official presentation, I'd like to let everyone know that we're offering Spanish interpreting interpretation during today's workshop webinar. Unfortunately, we're not able to provide American Sign Language or ASL interpretation today. Um, that should be resolved with our um, next public meetings. I'll read the instructions for joining the Spanish interpretation channel in English, and then one of our two Spanish interpreters will read them in Spanish. Simultaneous interpretation is being provided. English speakers may need to select English as their language. Accessing Zoom from a computer. Click the globe icon located at the bottom of the screen. Choose English. Accessing Zoom from a smartphone. Click the three dots above where it says more on the bottom right side of the screen. Choose language interpretation. Choose English. Press done on the top right side of the screen. Now I'll move on to the next slide. Interpretación simultánea al español disponible. Los hispanohablantes deben seleccionar su idioma. Entrando a Zoom por la computadora, haga clic en el símbolo del globo terráqueo en la parte inferior de la pantalla. Seleccione español. Apague el audio original para solo escuchar una voz. Entrando a Zoom por un teléfono inteligente, haga clic en los tres puntos encima de la palabra more o más en la parte inferior derecha de la pantalla. Seleccione interpretación, seleccione español, haga clic en done o finalizar arriba y al lado derecho de la pantalla. Yes, thank you. I do see that there is a hand up. Um, maybe um, whoever's doing the Q&A, um, I'm thinking maybe there's a technical issue. So for now, yes, if there's technical issues, um, then we could take that question now. Uh, if not, uh, we'll wait until our first um, question and answer session. Yeah, I'll go ahead and uh, unmute. Uh, it's Jen Zhu. Jen Zhu, I've uh, unmuted you. You can unmute yourself to speak. Sorry, that was an accident. Oh, no worries. Yep. Okay, thank you. Just want to make sure there are no technical difficulties. All right, we'll officially begin the workshop. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us. I'm Stephanie Parent, and I'll lead today's workshop on the fiscal year 2024-25 draft funding plan for clean transportation incentives, also called the funding plan. I'm here with our great team who will present and answer questions today. Here are a few quick details. We'll post the recording and attendee list on the Low Carbon Transportation Incentives webpage in about two weeks. We'll share the link in the chat now. Today's materials, including the agenda and slides, are also on that page. To ask questions, Use the raised hand feature in Zoom or press pound two on your phone during the Q&A question and answer sessions. You can also email us at cleantransportationincentives at arb.ca.gov. We'll keep an eye on that email inbox. Staff will drop the email address in the chat. If there are any disruptions during the meeting, we might need to reschedule it. Please ensure your name is visible on Zoom or adjust your phone number to the last four digits if calling in. Now, let's dive into today's agenda. 
We'll begin today's workshop with an overview of the Clean Transportation Incentives Funding Plan and information about historical and current funding. Next, we'll provide an update on the light duty vehicle incentive projects and the sustainable community-based transportation equity incentive projects, followed by a short break. After the break, we'll provide an update on our medium and heavy duty on and off-road incentive projects. Lastly, we'll wrap the day up with next steps. Please note, we'll provide time during the meeting for questions and discussion. Okay, let's begin. First, I'm gonna cover a bit about the purpose of the funding plan, how much funding CARB has been given through the state budget over the years, and the funding source for this year's funding plan. This slide provides information about the funding plan and the development process. This year, due to the state budget deficit, CARB was given a small amount of funding. So the focus of our discussion today will mostly be about CARB staff's draft policy changes for our incentive projects. This is where we would like to get your comments, questions, and feedback on. Okay, thank you. Let's look at the historical appropriations for the clean transportation incentives over the past decade. This year's appropriation builds on the approximately $6.1 billion that has been invested since 2013. Fiscal years 2021-22 and 2022-23, which were the first two years of the Zero Emission Vehicle Package, or ZEV package, saw large funding appropriations. These were intended to serve as down payments with annual funding appropriations scaling down over the remaining years of the ZEV package. CARB has several funding sources for its incentive projects. Today, we're only gonna focus on the Air Quality Improvement Program, or AQIP, funding source, because that is the only program CARB has received funds for this year. AQIP is the original funding program for clean transportation incentives and provides the framework for each annual funding plan. This year, the state budget includes just under $35 million for AQIP. Legislation specifies that AQIP funds can only be used for projects that reduce criteria air pollutants in the heavy duty sector. As noted on the previous slide, just under $35 million were appropriated for the Air Quality Improvement Program, or AQIP, to fund projects that reduce criteria air pollutants in the logistics, goods movement, off-road, warehouse, and port sectors. This year, of that allocation, CARB staff proposes to allocate $5 million to the Zero Emission Truck Loan Assistance Project, $14.97 million to the Innovative Small E-Fleets, or ICEF project, and $14.97 million to the Clean Off-Road Equipment, or CORE project. We'll discuss this more during the medium and heavy-duty vehicle portion of today's workshop. We'll now shift the focus to our light-duty and sustainable community equity projects, which will be presented by my colleague, Maggie Witt. Hi, everyone. My name is Maggie Witt, and in this portion of today's workshop, I'll provide updates on the light duty vehicle purchase incentive projects um, that are included in the draft funding plan. I'll also quickly touch on the sustainable community based transportation equity projects. First, let's begin with CARB's light duty purchase incentives. In general, these projects focus on helping individuals, households, and communities both purchase zero emission vehicles and transition to more sustainable modes. 
At our first funding plan workshop, we provided an overview of each of these projects. But today, my remarks are going to focus on the four programs that are included in the draft funding plan. The Driving Clean Assistance Program, Clean Cars for All, the Zero Emission Assurance Project, and the California E-Bike Incentive Project. First up, the Driving Clean Assistance Program, or DCAP. For funding year 2024-25, no funds have been appropriated. However, the project still has funds from prior year allocations. Additionally, there will be a proposed formula for future allocations that I will discuss on the next slide. As for project launch, a soft launch is planned for late summer 2024, starting in the Imperial Valley region. Then the project will continue to roll out region by region across the state. DCAP remains committed to a needs-based approach throughout all phases of its upcoming launch. As noted in the draft funding plan, staff proposes a project criteria change that will increase the previous financing loan cap from $30,000 to $45,000. This change was made in response to stakeholder feedback and market analysis that would enable further opportunities for participants to find vehicles. While the loan cap would increase with the proposed change, the interest rate for these loans will remain capped at 8%. Next, let's discuss the Regional Clean Cars for All program, or CC4A. Five air districts manage CC4A, which helps lower income drivers replace their older, high polluting cars with zero or near zero emission vehicles. Although no new funds are allocated for CC4A for the fiscal year 2024-25 budget, there are still funds from previous years. CARB can reallocate funds, so the plan is to shift 14 million from DCAP to the San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution Control District to maintain funding through fiscal year 2023-24. There are no changes to project criteria, but CARB is updating the program based on last year's funding plan, including adding zero emission motorcycles and increasing incentives it or adaptive equipment if needed. CARB is also revising the funding allocation formula and will propose changes in, an upcoming, in the upcoming proposed funding plan. A public work group will likely be held in the coming weeks to collect input on this formula. A public notice about that work group is forthcoming. Lastly, efforts to identify underserved populations will be included in the Assembly Bill 630 Goal Setting Report, which is an appendix to the proposed funding plan. Now let's transition to talk about the Zero Emission Assurance Project, or ZAP. ZAP was established by Assembly Bill, or AB 93, to help reduce the risk of buying a used zero emission vehicle or near zero emission vehicle like a plug-in hybrid or a conventional hybrid vehicle. And specifically, the project would provide a rebate or a vehicle service contract for the replacement battery or fuel cell components for these vehicles. Repair costs are a significant barrier to obtaining a zero or near zero emission vehicle for lower income Californians. So SAP complements CARB's light duty vehicle purchase incentive programs by alleviating low-income residents' concerns about premature battery degradation, which can ca cause reduced vehicle performance, vehicle depreciation, and costly repairs. CARB's, <clears throat> excuse me, CARB staff's initial thinking for ZAP eligibility includes that participants must have taken part in district or CARB CC4A and financing assistance pilot programs, or in the upcoming driving clean assistance program, DCAP, which I just talked about. They must also have continuously owned their vehicles since buying it 
buying it through the CARB incentive program. AB 193 limits ZAP incentives to one per vehicle um, and introduces new income limits that differ from CARB's usual thresholds. CARB's historical income limits were based on 400% of the federal poverty level, but have recently changed to 300%. We aim to align ZAP income limits with CARB's existing programs to simplify the process for applicants. We're currently reviewing these differences and we'll update you in the next work group meeting. Given that most manufacturer warranties cover 10 years and up to 100,000 miles, and that ZAP covers used vehicles, providing an extended warranty period of up to 15 years or 200,000 miles, this should more than cover project participants' needs. Research shows that many batteries, including those in hybrids and electric vehicles, can last up to 300,000 miles with proper care. We propose ZAP incentives of up to $7,500 to cover premature battery or fuel cell failures, including labor, based on average replacement costs and in alignment with DCAP grants. If repair costs exceed this amount, participants can choose to replace their vehicle instead. This replacement incentive can be combined with local or federal programs, but not with other CARB purchase incentives. Lastly, instead of scrapping older zero emission vehicles, we're considering donating them to community colleges for use in automotive technician training programs. Now let's shift our focus to the California e-bike incentive project, which will provide incentives of up to $2,000 to low-income Californians 18 years or older towards the purchase of electric bikes or e-bikes. First, $31 million has been allocated and $13 million is currently in the grant with the administrator pedal ahead. Once the project launches, eligible applicants can receive a base voucher of $1,750 towards the purchase of an e-bike and accessories, such as locks, helmets, safety equipment, and assembly and delivery. Furthermore, those who have a household income at or below 225% of the federal poverty level or living in disadvantaged and low-income communities are eligible for an additional $250. That brings the maximum incentive amount to $2,000. CARB also has a $5 million set aside for priority applicants to ensure that they will have increased access to e-bikes. Funds are also available for community-based organizations to help with outreach and education to community residents. Eligible e-bikes include class one, two, and three bikes and require underwriter laboratories or European standard certifications for battery safety. Both brick and mortar and online purchases are eligible through approved retailers that meet the program requirements. Now that we've covered some of the nuts and bolts of the e-bike project, let's talk about the soft launch, which is currently underway in collaboration with four communities. A key element of the soft launch has been its emphasis on providing robust outreach to residents through partnering with local community-based organizations and providing application assistance and testing all our systems ahead of the statewide launch. Some lessons learned from the soft launch include the following. First, the need for improved education and outreach to ensure that retailers and applicants are familiar with project requirements. Second, we have simplified the incentive structure to make the purchases easier at the point of sale. And third, we have expanded the list of eligible accessories, which will help with e-bike safety and functionality. Overall, we expect to continue working through issues raised during the soft launch, 
so that we're ready for a full statewide launch later this year. Please make sure you visit our website for more information and sign up for the mailing list um, at the official statewide launch announcement. Now I'm going to shift gears to briefly discuss the sustainable community-based transportation equity projects. These five projects, which are shown on the slide, provide funding for the planning and implementation of clean mobility solutions that support community transportation needs and help folks get around without owning a car. The projects in this portfolio include the Statewide Clean Mobility Option Vouchers, or CMO, Regional Clean Mobility Pilots, Planning and Capacity Building Grants, Clean Mobility in Schools Grants, and the Sustainable Transportation Equity Project, or STEP Grants. For this fiscal year, these projects have not been allocated funding, and CARB staff are not proposing any policy changes or updates. Nevertheless, several efforts within these projects are underway or will be launching later this year. For more information about these efforts, I encourage you to visit CARB's website and to reach out to CARB staff if you have questions or wish to get more involved. And that's all for me. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we'll now open the floor for questions and comments about this part of the presentation. To ask a question or make a comment, if you are on your Zoom desktop, uh, please click raise hand under the participants tab. If you are on Zoom through your mobile phone, uh, tap the raise hand in the more tab. And if you're calling in through your phone, please press star two to raise your hand. You can also email questions to the clean transportation incentives at arb.ca.gov email. This email address will also be posted in the chat. Uh, once your line is open, please state your name and affiliation, if any, before speaking. And if you're emailing us uh, to the clean transportation incentives at arb.gov, um, our email monitor will notify us of your questions. All right, I'll take the. Sorry, before we take the raised hands, um, we did have several questions that came in through the Q&A feature, and I believe that Lisa McCumber will respond to those. Um, I see that one more came into the Q&A, so I'll have to look and see what that question is, but um, uh, we are going to, after that, close the Q&A feature. Um, uh, unfortunately, that for us doesn't always work well as a as a way to take questions and answers um, and it's easier to do use the raised hand feature. So right now I'd like to hand it over to Lisa McCumber. Thanks, Steph. Um, yeah, sorry folks. The the QA does cause some complications for us. So I'm gonna run through the questions we've received thus far. And then as Steph said, that feature will um, be disabled post post these four and we'll move back to hand uh, raises. So really quick. Um, we received a question from Edgar Becerra. Will any of today's incentives discuss active transportation or TDM funding? Um, uh, yes, Edgar, it will. Although, as we noted in the beginning part of this presentation, there is no additional funding for those types of sources this year. Um, and we've, we have covered those initial slides, but we are happy to talk about needs uh, and interests within the active transportation space. Um, another question we received, this one, it says from Anonymous, and I'm not sure why, how that is, but will the slideshow be ma made available to people in attendance? Yes, the slideshow is posted on our webpage, um, and we'll make sure to drop a new link in the chat for you to access. From Daniel Patosh, why did no funding come from the GGRF for AQIP? Um, so AQIP is a separate funding source. It does not usually receive funding from the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. Um, typically we get, we receive funding from the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund for our low carbon transportation program um, and low carbon transportation program and the air quality improvement program work together to fund this large suite of projects that we're, we'll, we're covering today. And this year, the budget is very, very tight um, in state government, and there is unfortunately no funding available to us within GGRF. Um, and then, um, 
uh, from Rafe Porter. Oh, and I have another question that came in. Um, so then from Rafe, uh, what's the schedule for creating the funding formula for CC4A and how do we get involved in the work group? Great question, Rafe. Um, we are working through um, the kind of base development for that formula right now. We do hope to begin um, kind of talking with all the program staff at the districts within the next uh, week or two. And I believe right now we've got a work group plan for September 10th. So we're hoping to finish up um, some information around that and start to get information out to you all really soon. So hang tight. My team will be in touch with you soon. Um, and then the last question uh, that just came in uh, from Maya uh, Inigo Anderson, um, CBE is really looking forward to the new e-bike program. What are the more specific timeline expectations for statewide rollout? Um, great question. We are, as we noted in the slides, we are still working through a few little bumps um, from the lessons that we've learned through the soft launch. Our biggest challenge, as we noted on those slides, really is making sure that we've got bike shops engaged um, and able to handle folks coming in. Um, and that is a challenge that was a challenge within just the small regions, and we anticipate it to be a challenge statewide, but we are working through it. We really do hope to launch that program. Um, within the next uh, next month or so, a couple of months, um, as we're wrapping up some of those final pieces. So, all right, I'm going to go ahead and kick it back um, for online raised hands. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I'll hand it back to Amrit in just a minute, but just wanted to touch on the um, the anonymous. Um, yeah, if you're in Zoom, um, you. People may have come in late and missed the beginning, but just a reminder that um, we do need everyone to show their name um, in the in the Zoom platform. Thanks. I'll hand it back to Amrit. Thank you so much. So we have a raised hand uh, from Laura Renger. Uh, we have unmuted your line. You are free to speak. Please remember to state your name and affiliation, if any. Hi, thank you. This is Laura Ranger from the California Electric Transportation Coalition. Um, I just wanted to thank staff for this presentation um, and for all the work that you've been doing. Um, we've been following this very closely and we just really appreciate um, all of the engagement here. We also wanted to just strongly support the allocation to the San Joaquin Valley. Um, there's a lot of need there and I think it's really important that we just try to make sure that we don't have start and stop in the programs. Um, so to the extent, if there's anything more we can do to ensure uh, continuity, you know, I think that would be uh, really great. And then also, is there any way that we could get a little bit more data on the burn rate for each of the CC4A programs? Um, just given that really that's all we have right now in terms of light duty incentives uh, for the vehicle side in the whole state, it would be helpful to really understand, you know, how fast that money is being used um, or, or if there's a way that we can kind of get more granularity around that data. Well, that's it. Thank you. Amrit, are you available? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, so if you could please um, mute Laura's. Um, um, yeah, I could go to the next person. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, I skipped the part about somebody answering the questions. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Okay. Um, is there someone in the CC4A program that could respond to that? Yeah, I'll jump in really quick. We're having a few technical difficulties. Oh, there's Olivia. Maybe Olivia can jump in. Yeah, um, I would just say um, for the burn rate, I think that was the main question. Um, we can follow up with you um, offline and kind of give you um, an estimate for like at least this year, what the burn rate has been the last six months. Um, so maybe if you can put your name in the chat or something so I can follow up with you, that would be great. Thank you, Olivia. Our next raise hand is from Roman Partida Lopez. Uh, we have unmuted your line. You're free to speak. Please remember to state your name and affiliation, if any. 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is uh, Roman Partida Lopez uh, with the Green Lining Institute. Yeah, first off, thank you to to staff for working uh, and developing this this funding plan, knowing uh, that we have you know budget constraints and and still being able to to put something forward that you know we can we can review and and respond to. Um, on that vein, I also want to acknowledge and and uplift the fact that uh, the documents were posted you know several days in advance to to help us. Uh, be able to review and then uh, be ready for the, the conversation that we're having today. So uh, I want to provide um, you know an acknowledgement of that. Um, a couple of thoughts, and uh, there's going to be a couple of set of comments, and then a couple of questions for you all. Um, so first off, uh, you know I think you know given the fact that there isn't much uh, budget this year, and that we're really only working with with equip funds. I know this is uh, a priority for you all, but I just kind of want to reinstate for the other programs that um, are not seeing any funding or that um, significant policy changes to to really prioritize the the contracting and implement, implementation process. Uh, you know, I think this year and in previous years when we've talked about the funding plan, there's been several programs, including you know the DCAP, the e-bike. Um, even some of the mobility programs where we, we, we keep hearing like, yes, we're, we're working on it, we're implementing, we'll see a rollout in the fall. And, uh, you know, I, I understand that there's a lot of complications to um, and challenges uh, that you all need to go through to be able to reach those contracts and then implement. Um, but this is just an ongoing issue that I think we need to find some sort of solution because this year, as we saw through the budget process, there was a lot of conversations about clawbacks, right? And potentially dipping into some of the funds that CARB has for these programs because it's been multiple years since the money was allocated and not implemented. So, you know, we're strong advocates of these programs and we wanna make sure that, you know, we're utilizing the funds and, and we wanna avoid any type of situation where uh, there's conversations about potential clawbacks of funding that's supposed to be provided for, for equity, uh, transportation equity programs. Um, the other comment is also regarding, you know, the, the outreach and education efforts that are that have been happening. It's something that we've talked about over the years and really wanting to uplift and, and glad to see the, the various community evening uh, workshops that have happened. Um, and I recently also saw that there is going to be some in person uh, meetings as well. So wanted to just also acknowledge and uplift that um, as those continue, uh, you know, we really hope that the um, the information or what is shared from community members is captured um, and hopefully help guide the policy changes that are being recommended or, or um, suggested here so that we ensure that the community voices are also helping inform, um, you know, what we end up seeing uh, for, for program implementation. Um, and I hope that that structure continues moving forward, right? Uh, so that we are meeting communities uh, where they're at uh, by attending their community meetings um, at their time and then being able to share a lot of what you, um, you know, what, what is sharing what you are sharing with us, but with them in a more intentional way. So those are just some overlap, overarching comments that I wanted to make before jumping into some of my, my questions regarding the, the, the slides that you shared. Um, in regards to to DCAP, uh, yeah, I think you know the the phased rollout to the program um, is something that you know we're or at least greenlining is you know uh, okay with. Um, I think what we have questions about those. I think something that was just shared around, and maybe this was a uh, just wanted to clarify in that it said that the statewide rollout is going to be region by region, right? So we're going to go imp Imperial Valley in late 2024, and then after that region by region. So if someone can help unpack what that means, because um, I think this is the first time I've heard that it would go from the Imperial Valley to then a region to region approach. So uh, we'd like some clarification there. And then in regards to the actual program, you know, one of the things that we really wanted to see from the previous program, the clean, the clean vehicle assistance program was really like leveraging the loan loss reserve and actually being a financing program and not just like another incentive program. So I'm really curious to hear any updates that y'all might have on how that financing piece is going, what lenders have been have been contracted, uh, what the potential um, what the potential uh, financing structure is going to look like. Because in the last uh, work group that happened around the light duty incentives, you know there was some discussion about the policy changes of elevating it to forty five thousand uh, the loan amount. 
And then someone put in the chat of like what that implication would be at an 8% rate APR uh, um, uh, loan. So, you know, just curious of like how we're going to be addressing that uh, moving forward. And then related to that is the ZAP program. The ZAP program is also tied to, to this DCAP program. Uh, you all talk about it separately, and that's fine. But the implementation and the implementation group is the same age, uh, the same folks. So I'm just curious how that rollout is going to go and how that coordination is going to go with, um, you know, with the regional programs for Clean Cars for All that, uh, um, you know, are in coordination, but that uh, might need some additional support to help ensure the that, you know, there's um, there that both programs are talking to each other. And um, and then in regards to the regional clean cars for all, yeah, we appreciate the, the um, you know, the allocation or reallocation of the 14 million to the San Joaquin Valley program. I also um, would be curious around the, the burn rate, but then also just really thinking about, um, you know, the sustainability of the other programs, uh, uh, regional programs, and whether there's a need to kind of start planning for potentially them also being out of funding. Um, so we'd love to hear more about that. And then Lastly, um, in regards to these programs, um, the e-bike program, um, yeah, it seems like, again, like there's been just these continued questions around the rollout from the soft launch, the statewide launch, statewide launch. and in the uh, funding plan, there was language around potentially, you know, re-evaluating and potentially rolling out, um, putting out a call for a new project administrator, and I'm just curious of when that, um, potential determination would be made. And sorry, and then lastly, um, there wasn't a lot of conversation around the mobility projects, but looking at previous funding plans, there was some fund, there was 60 million, I think that was allocated last year for the for these uh, mobility programs, 50 million for the programs themselves, 10 million for planning and uh, capacity building. And I'm curious, I looked to kind of try to find updates as to where the money has gone and I couldn't find it. So if can someone direct me to where exactly I could find information of, you know, what projects received the 50 million and then how the 10 million in capacity building has been invested. So apologies for, um, you know, being long-winded here, but I uh, wanted to take advantage of the opportunity and appreciate any feedback y'all have. All right, Roman, thank you so much for your comments. I'll, I'll kick it off. This is Bertel Cardenas, manager at CARB. Um, I'll start with tackling um, the first few comments about kind of process with our grants and how long it takes to get our programs up and running. Um, you know, I do um, understand, you know, where you're coming from in terms of that. It, it took us a while to, to get the funding. And then at least in terms of DCAP, we finally got a grant signed at the end of last year. Um, and we're now at a point where we're, we're a few weeks away now from launch. Um, and so to us, this is record time, you know, less than a year from signing the grant, we're, we're gonna have that program up and running. Um, but, you know, I think what we're doing is um, everything we can to speed up, you know, the internal administrative process, but at the same time, making sure that we reserve time to hold work groups and talk through the process with, stakeholders to ensure that we're getting their input along the way before we stand a program up. And so that does take a little extra time, especially when we're talking about a needs-based program um, and making sure we're uh, directly involved with CBOs as we're getting these programs up and running. Um, so I do um, understand your comments there um, and we'll do the best we can to continue, you know, getting these programs up and running um, as quickly as we can. And let's see, I will turn it over to Tiffany Wynn um, to, to cover some additional uh, questions that you have. Yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Raquel. So Ramon, I can take on that question about the regional rollout. So just as a quick update or reminder, we did host a work group on this regional rollout in, on May 16th, I believe. I can have one of my colleagues reach out and drop the uh, uh, kind of the uh, information and the materials that we had presented in that work group uh, in the chat, or we can reach out to you and um, send you that information. But in that work group, we did discuss regional rollout. We also discussed regional buckets of, for funding as well. So a lot of the logistics in that of what you were asking are in that presentation. So I could go ahead and just forward on that information on over to you. But yes, we will be uh, re rolling out regionally. This is in support of the needs-based process and, and the 
need to put in and prioritize communities that have had not had CARB investments before. So this is in just kind of uh, making sure that uh, all those communities are supported. And I'm going to add, to... Tiffany, that the, the chat's actually disabled. So um, for follow-up, uh, for example, like the burn rate um, stats, you can email the um, Clean Transportation Incentives email that was dropped in the chat earlier, um, and then we'll follow up with you. Yeah, thanks, Tiffany. And uh, just to chime in here real quick. Yeah, I, I, I just pulled it up, so no need to, to follow up. I'll, I'll take a look at the presentation, so I, I appreciate that. Um, I think one one more point I'll just make, if I if I may, um, in regards to just the burn rate or even just access to to data about the programs. Um, I know you all rolled out the California Zev Investment website some time ago now, and I think if there's a way to utilize that website, you all have to provide more frequent updates on the programs themselves, whether that be the the well, right now it's really mostly focused on the Zev Incentive programs. But before with um, CVRP, there was a more uh, updated ticker that like updated how much funding was left and how it was being used. So if it would be possible to kind of replicate that for these programs, I think it'd be really helpful to help us be able to have somewhere, um, somewhere to look uh, rather than having always just to go to staff. I mean, I don't mind going to staff. I know, I know y'all are busy, but if there's a way to more publicly have that information available and utilizing the resources that you have, like the Cal, Zev Insights website, that I think would be something that would be really helpful. Thank you for your comment, uh, Ramon there. Um, I also wanted to just quickly follow up with your, addition, your your other comment about kind of what the lenders are. Mm -hmm. So uh, as you may know, CHDC has a quite a few networks of lenders. So some of those include uh, Travis Credit Union, Clean Energy Credit Union, Self-Help Credit Union, USC Credit Union, and Valley First Credit Union. Uh, I do highly recommend, for additional information, uh, Virgil Looney from the CHTC team uh, will be your point of contact there. So uh, I will defer to uh, Virgil on that. And let me see here, what else? Michael Litwin, are you available to discuss the ZAP portion? Yes, I am. Alrighty, I'll hand it on over to you. Uh, thank you, Tiffany. Uh, hi, Ramon. Uh, so I'm a project lead on the ZAP program. And you were asking about when the launch was. Right now, the goal is to launch in 2025. Uh, we're not real sure exactly when yet, but they'll be coming forth more soon. And you were also asking uh, how we're going to work with DCAP. Right now, that is something we are actually working with DCAP to figure out as well. Uh, we did have a meeting on August 6th that went over some of the initial policy and uh, pretty much the slides you saw here summarize that. Um, do you have any other questions on Zap before I go ahead and pass it along? Um, yeah, no, that, that's helpful. I think part of the conversation was, you know, it, it's coordinated with DCAP, but I think from what I saw, um, eligible folks are folks who participated in, in Clean Cars for All previously and or I think um, the Clean Vehicle Assistance Program and just asking about the coordination that, that that's probably needed with um, the regional programs as well. Yes, we have taken that into account, the, the coordination that will be happening with the regional programs as well. Uh, so we do have a list for them on which vehicles right. were incentivized. Okay. And my last question is uh, related to this is, um, you know, I think, you know, the, this bill was passed in 2018, um, 2019, I believe now, or 2018 or 2019. So it's been multiple years. It's taken some time to implement. And one thing that I'm, I'm really hoping that we, we can do and uh, moving forward on these programs is just really evaluate the, the, the need and cost effectiveness of them if possible, right? Um, uh, maybe I'm not so much the cost effectiveness, but just the, the need for the programs themselves, right? And um, you know, I, I understand um, wanting to, to continue to explore this, but yeah, I think like just wanting to see whether, because whether like this program is still needed, right? When we like how we first initially, when it was initially passed. So not something you need to answer, but just maybe at some point really reflecting um, whether this is something that we should continue to move forward or whether that money that's been allocated here might be best suited for something else. I know this was legislatively, legislatively mandated, so that creates additional challenges there. 
but yeah, just kind of reflecting on how to make sure that we're best maximizing the, the limited funding that we have. Well, let me go ahead and uh, let Lisa answer this part. Sure. Uh, she will have a little more information for you. Yeah, thanks, Ramon. And I'm glad that you acknowledged that last piece, which is, you know, we were given a legislative task here that um, that at the time we actually had tried to inform folks that we didn't, there was, this was more of a perception issue. Mm. We didn't have a lot of facts or information around what the failure rate was for batteries, but what we were seeing is it was very rare. There was not a lot of them. And when the legislature allocated 10 million, we knew that that was going to be a lot mm. for what we thought this program was going to need, but that is what was done. And we, as you know, through the legislative process, our hands are a bit tied. So we have 10 million that we received in 2022. Um, and when we got the funding, we didn't get any resources to implement it, uh, implement it. So through this public process, we have tried to be very transparent in that we were not going to touch it until this year. Um, we didn't have the capacity to do so. So we are planning, we are developing it now. Um, when we committed to doing so, we will build it in and fully agree. Our hope is that once we kind of launch something, we get a better sense of what the potential needs are going forward. We've identified the first um, group of vehicles we think that will qualify for the program. We know that that's not gonna use up 10 million, um, but because it was a legislatively directed amount of funds, we don't have flexibility to just move that money somewhere else. Hmm. Um, that takes a legislative action. So our goal is to continue to provide information once we do roll the program out. Um, so that if in fact money needs to be moved, the legislature will have that information to to do what they what they wish at that point. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay, I think we've got Sean coming up next. Yep. All right, Sean. Yeah. Hey, Ramon. Uh, this is Sean, lead staff for the California E-Bike Incentive Project. And the question was uh, about the language in the funding plan for potentially choosing a new project administrator. Mm -hmm. the e -bike, yeah. Yeah. And so we have that language in there to provide flexibility for us kind of down the line as the project progresses. But currently, we're moving ahead with the statewide launch with our current administrator. When does the... Yeah, that, thanks. And when would the but when would that decision be made? Like when is their contract up? In 2026. 2026. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I think it's my turn. Um, thanks, Ramon. Um, on the mobility projects, a couple of years ago we had uh discussed in the the public process about um doing a new um solicitation with a new administrator for mobility projects this year. When we realized and found out last year that no money was going to be in the budget, um, we took the sixty million to our board, and um, what we did was we put that we put the funds uh, into the uh, previous RFA responses for STEP and clean mobility in schools, um, and so we funded more of the projects that were uh, applied for during that period. For CMO, what we did. Um, is we uh, increase the voucher amounts from 1.5 to 1.8 million. So about 300,000 more um, is available for each of the vouchers. We've got roughly 44 of those, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so for mobility projects throughout the state. And then the planning grants, um, the 10 million for planning, what we're planning on, what we're hoping to do is release an RFA pretty soon for communities to apply for planning grants. Um, we had a work group, I think in February, where we went through all of this. Uh, to discuss you know, what our proposals were. Um, so we're looking forward to getting these communities additional funding. Um, we have now a year or two where we don't have addition, we don't have more funding coming in. So we're looking at trying to build those communities up, figure out how to get them uh, to be sustainable in the long term and uh, all the other issues that go along with them. But uh, a lot of them launched and and, and are doing uh, are doing well. So uh, appreciate the question and hopefully that. Yeah, I appreciate, appreciate that, Sam. Um, yeah, and you know, I think that's something that for for Greenlanding, um, any of our chart our partners in charge ahead, uh, we've been strongly advocating for for mobility funding, right, and, and making sure that these programs are are up and running. And so, yeah, definitely want to follow up just to see how those programs are doing. And um, I know, I think it's I don't think Carve is hosting it, but maybe it's in conjunction with. Um, uh, 
the administrators of the mobility program. So it'd be great um, if there's a way to access that information prior to that clean mobility convening that's happening in October of where the programs are at to be able to like really lean into the conversation about how to, the challenges that have come up with these programs, but how to like ensure the sustainability of them as well. Yeah, absolutely. That's a big, it's a big component of the, the forum in October yeah. um, that, that we're funding through the, uh, the CMO administrator. Um, what we're trying to do also is trying to pull, pull away the CMO from CMO. So it's not just connected with CMO. Uh, the CMEA, which is Clean Mobility Equity Alliance, covers it's the umbrella for all the mobility projects and the planning projects we've got. But yeah, that should be a great event. Hopefully you'll be able to make it down and uh, we'll be able to to fill in folks on uh, the work that we've been trying to do for the last 10 years. Thank you. Um, before I hand things back over to Amrit, um, you know, we didn't go through any uh, meeting agreements at the beginning of this uh, webinar, but um, we generally usually have the practice of, um, you know, making space for other people if um, you're one that that speaks a lot, um, making sure to give up other people opportunities to ask questions, um, and also taking space that if you tend to be someone who doesn't ask questions, um, you know, maybe try to uh, push yourself a little to, to ask something. And um, we do appreciate all the questions, Roman, um, but we only have a few minutes left for this session. And so, uh, you know, maybe people could ask, you know, one question and then you could always raise your hand again to ask other questions. So we give people as, as many people an opportunity to ask questions uh, as possible. Thanks. Amrit. Thank you. Uh, we have a raised hand from David Wrightmuth. Uh, David, you have been unmuted uh, and you are free to speak. Please remember to state your name and affiliation, if any. Hi, this is uh, Dave Wrightmuth from the Union Concerned Scientists. Um, so uh, is there any information available on the actual amounts of money remaining for all the programs? In addition to the burn rate, I'd be interested in that information. Um, and, and because we don't know the, both the burn rate and the amount of money left, um, it's hard to see, know how well funded or unfunded these programs are. Um, it, I'd like to hear what your ideas are on, in terms of prioritization in the programs, uh, especially in the drive clean, uh, or sorry, the driving cleaner assistance program, how you're going to prioritize, um, when you have run out of money and you know there, there's also the need for i just want to point out there's need for reporting and, and data on these programs um more than that's currently available when you look at the past cvap program we saw um a fair number of people that were like that uh said that they were paying cash or had access to a very low interest rate loan without assistance um, and I'm just wondering if maybe you can, as part of the prioritization, prioritize people that actually utilize the financing assistance, the loan assistance portion, because um, that is sort of a marker of need for the assistance. Um, and if someone is paying cash in addition to the grant or has access to a low interest rate loan outside of the program, that is maybe a marker of somebody that it, it could be deprioritized in a in a fiscally constrained program. Hi, David. Uh, I could go ahead and take some of the questions that are related to the DCAP program. So kind of working backwards a little bit here, what we are looking at in terms of like funding uh, and prioritization of funding. So again, I kind of want to refer you back to the May 16th work group where our uh, where Virgil Looney, our uh, main lead over at CHDC, has brought in kind of their analysis on how to sustain funding, even if there is no um, dollars coming in from the budget. So I want to refer you to that presentation as well. But through the needs-based process and kind of where we are at with DCAP, uh, there are funding buckets earmarked for specific regions so we can ensure that there's continued operations in each of the regions. But again, kind of based on the data that we receive and kind of on a like 
we're putting our finger on the pulse here to make sure to, and to see which regions may need additional assistance in terms of like outreach case management and whatever areas uh, that we find that are in need. We can redirect some of the like, even, yes, very limited, but we are ensuring that each region has specific buckets to ensure that operation continues as normal. Um, and in, in regards to the comment about that you had about individuals with uh, cash and entering the program, we do also have survey data and those surveys will be with, uh, with each of the participants so we can see uh, how folks are kind of sustaining their loan and if they are, are they really in prioritization? That's something that we're looking into and we're just trying to establish data for before we can make policy decisions. So I did wanna keep that uh, in mind for you um, and go from there. So again, as we continue to roll out DCAP, um, we are keeping our fingers on the pulse. We're trying to see what data comes in and utilizing the data in a way that informs our policies moving forward. Uh, thanks, Tiffany. I just also wanted to touch on the the, the data piece. We've got a lot of questions about um, burn rate for Clean Cars for All and other programs. I just want to remind folks that on our Clean Cars for All website, which we can have staff um, drop drop a link or you can follow up on our clean transportation um, uh, email, um, we do have, we do post raw data, we post our quarterly report summary statistics. So that data is available online and we will, we are happy to take suggestions on how to uh, improve the visualization or what additional data um, that we could provide that, that kind of helps people visualize kind of what's going on with the program. So I just wanted to, to send that reminder that um, we do post our, we do post our quarterly reporting data um, on our website, and it's all available. There's um, there's Excel spreadsheets that you can download. You can um, slice and dice the data. You can look at you know you can look at um, just about every field that we collect in our quarterly reports from districts. Um, but if there's if there's something else that we can do to um, better illustrate the data that we have, um, we are we're always open to those suggestions. So I just wanted to remind folks of that. Thank you, Erin. Thank you, Tiffany. Um, All right. Rich, sorry, can I just jump in for a second? Of course. Um, sorry. Uh, so um, after Joel Silverthorne, um, we'll stop. Um, please no more raised hands um, after that for now. Um, and real quick, we um, will go a few minutes over to try to answer all the questions of the hands raised right now. Um, and then we'll probably shorten um, our break to maybe more like five minutes. Thanks, Amrit. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, next raise hand is from Tung Lee. Uh, you have been unmuted uh, and you are free to speak. Please remember to state your name and affiliation, if any. Yeah, hi, good morning. This is Tung Lee, Executive Director of California Air Pollution Control Officers Association. I don't have any questions for you this morning, just more comments and really just wanted to express CAPCOA's gratitude to staff for holding this workshop. Um, you know, as we all know, mobile emissions make up uh, a significant majority of the emissions that we still see in the atmosphere, despite decades of success in the mo in the stationary source programs and all the work the air districts and CARB have done together over the years. So these emission reductions are critically important. And again, I wanted to thank staff for keeping your foot on the accelerator and getting us ready to implement these programs, despite the lack of funding for several areas um, in, 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 this, in this fiscal year. Um, CAPCOA and the Air Districts really look forward to continuing to partner with CARB on implementing, designing these programs uh, so that we can get those emission reductions across the entire state. Uh, so again, I just wanted to pop on and say thank you very much for, uh, for holding this workshop and, and we look forward to continuing to engage with you. Thank you, Tung, really appreciate the comment. All right, our next raised hand is from Megan Richer. Megan, you have been unmuted. Uh, you're free to speak. Please remember to state your name and affiliation, if any. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Megan Richer, and I'm here today from Via Transportation. 
VIA has partnered with municipalities and local agencies across California to deploy clean mobility options that serve some of California's most vulnerable residents. We've been able to provide these services um, in large part by funding from CARB's equity programs, including um, clean mobility options, CMO, clean mobility in schools, CMIS, and uh, sustainable transportation equity project STEP. And so as you all well know, um, due to legislators' actions, these programs will not be funded from the budget in fiscal year 2024 to 2025. And so the only comment I wanted to make today is just to urge CARB to use AQIP, um, which I understand is the only flexible funding it has in its control to restore funding for this program in fiscal year 2024 to 2025. Um, that's all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Megan. All right. I think we All got right. Yeah, uh, we have a raised hand from Christopher Chavez. Christopher, you have been unmuted and you are free to speak. Please remember to state your name and affiliation, if any. Yes, uh, thank you and uh, good morning. This is Chris Chavez with uh, Coalition for Clean Air. Uh, I you know, have a few questions to comment, so I'll save most of those for the end or just for, for another forum. I think the the main one uh, relating to uh, you know the clean cars for all program. Uh, first, you know, certainly glad to see that the uh, you know that their phase rollout for the DCAP program is still moving forward. Uh, also glad to see the initial program uh, in the uh, in the Imperial Valley uh, area. Uh, but regarding the uh, the current district based programs, uh, one of the you know I know that. The, uh, the presentation indicated that CARB can reallocate funding, uh, you know, to make sure that these programs are able to uh, continue functioning uh, as required by the legislature. Uh, one, you know, one of the concerns is particularly the 14 million for the San Joaquin program is only going to really last until the end of the year. So I'm curious as to what CARB is looking at or how CARB is going to kind of continue to reevaluate and how they plan on, you know, responding to the fact that this program may be running out of funding again by the end of the year, which would basically cut off the San Joaquin Valley from the Clean Cars for All program. Hey, Chris, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, you know, it is a challenge. We, with the budget, the way that it is this year and not receiving additional funding, um, we risk start stop for all of our programs. Um, and so we are kind of keeping an eye on all the funding that the programs are drawing down, um, especially across the districts and figuring out if there is a way that um, different programs can kind of support one another to get us across that finish line. So we don't have right now it is it, it's a continue to wait and see and look at the data and figure out what the actual needs are going forward. Um, you know, as we come into these winter months, we there does tend to be a little bit less of a draw on these programs. Um, so we're kind of hoping to see that balance things out a little bit, but until I think we get to that point, we don't, um, without additional funding, we don't have a great plan just yet. Uh, understood and, and certainly agree that it's unfortunate that the uh, the governor and the legislature's uh, budget did not reflect well on the, uh, or did not treat the uh, clean transportation programs well. So uh, your your point on that's understood. Thank you, Christopher. Our last raised hand is from Cameron. Joel. Yes. Sorry. I just, uh, I keep having problems turning on the camera. I just wanted to say a little bit more for uh, Megan Richer's um, comment. Um, the AQIP funding, um, I had covered it in the earlier slides, but unfortunately that funding is um, not so flexible. There's legislation that says that it can only be used for um, heavy duty types of projects. 
Um, so I think the, the mobility projects would not um, fall under that. Um, and yeah, so uh, apologies, I didn't address that earlier. Okay, thanks, Amrit. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, we were last raised hand from Joel Silverthorne. Uh, you have been unmuted and you are free to speak. Please remember to state your name and affiliation, if any. And just, uh, I think you're still unmuted, uh, so you can click unmute, Joel. Unmute, okay. There you go. Thank you. Um, my name's Joel Silverthorne, uh, no affiliation. We are senior citizens that are, uh, you're speaking way over our head when it comes to these uh, terms that we didn't grow up with these clean air, but um, we had, we are many senior citizens, low income. We are very much in need of, of this. And how do I, am I too late to get on a waiting program or on a wait list or for these? We, we're trying to get on a wait list for these programs. Hi. We're in Garden Grove. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I'm trying to turn on my camera. Um, okay. I think probably the best thing would be to um, send an email to our clean transportation incentives at arb.ca.gov email. Uh, we did drop that in the chat um, and um, put your question in there. And then we could direct you um, to the appropriate place. Um, it sounds like possibly you're asking about clean cars for all. And so maybe yeah. it would depend on if you're in a, an air district or if you're in another area that maybe doesn't um, have uh, such a program yet. Um, and if you, for some reason, if you can't grab that email address, I believe that our staff should be able to find the email address that you use to register and could reach out to you that way. So um, staff, if somebody could please uh, just make a note to make sure that um, we followed up with Joel after, that would be excellent. Thanks. I mean, I registered, so is that all I need to do to wait for, to be part of the program? It would have to be more detailed. Um, you know, we can't really get into specifics through this particular webinar. Um, uh, because there, there are many programs or projects around the state. Um, so, um, so yeah, I'm, yeah, in, I, I'm in one of the districts. Yeah. Okay. Hey, hey, Joel, th this is Nick yeah. Birch. I, I work in the outreach section, um, here yeah. at CARB. I'm happy to follow up with you directly and I can, um, yeah. either by email initially, and then we could have a discussion and I can help you out, find what you need. So how, how, how do I get in touch with you? I'll I'll reach out to you via email. I have it through the Zoom for through oh, your okay. Zoom registration, and then we can set okay. up a meeting to call or can discuss however you want. But I'll follow I up. Appreciate directly. it. I'll no problem, Joel. Pass thanks this for on to any other people that are learning a lot. Yeah, okay. I, I, thanks for for speaking up. We appreciate that. Thank you. That's all. Thanks, um, thanks, Joel, for your your question, and thanks, Nick, for um, following up with him. Um, so I'll hand it back to um well yeah i guess um, yeah we're done with the q a for right now um sorry we're a little bit behind schedule but let's take um a five minute break and uh, return at 10 45 and we'll start the next portion of our of our webinar thanks everyone
Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for hanging in. We are back from break now. I'm going to go ahead and give an overview of our medium and heavy duty vehicle and on and off road equipment investments. My name is April and I am leading the development of the heavy duty funding chapter within the funding plan. Thanks for hanging out uh, for our workshop today. I will provide a status update for the advanced technology demonstration and pilot project. The Clean Truck and Bus Voucher Program, or HFIP, the Innovative Small E Fleet Project, ICEF, the Clean Off Road Equipment Program, known as CORE, and the Zero Emission Truck Loan Pilot Project. In addition to those, I will be providing details on our workforce training and development efforts and the continued implementation of AB 794 to ensure that truck funding recipients are compliant with labor standards. Overall, our medium and heavy duty on and off-road equipment investments strive to continue to support regulatory efforts and build on efforts to ensure investments support our equity goals. We also strategically focus on priority populations by expanding support for small businesses and disadvantaged communities. We focus on reducing barriers for small fleets by expanding support through non-financial mechanisms and we also collaborate with other state agencies to ensure reduction of air pollutants emitted from medium and heavy duty on and off-road equipment to ultimately emit no harmful air pollutants. Heavy duty incentives previously focused on bringing cleaner technologies to the market. Today, with robust zero emission options now available on the market, incentives have shifted to support small fleets and businesses that need financial assistance the most, while continuing to support technology advancement in some of the most challenging sectors such as off-road. All of the projects you see here include support for small fleets and businesses with the zero emission truck loan pilot and ICEF designed specifically to help meet the unique needs of small businesses. The Advanced Technology Demonstration and Pilot Project was established in 2009 and has seen more than $600 million invested since. The goal is to accelerate pre-commercial technologies into the marketplace quicker than would happen organically and to support commercialized technology that would benefit from at-scale pilot projects to showcase feasibility and economic viability. Last summer, CARB and CEC jointly released a solicitation for demonstration and pilot project funding. There were 10 eligible project categories and funding dedicated to support commercial harbor craft regulatory compliance. A total of 31 applications were submitted, requesting $425 million in funding. 12 applications have been selected for funding, and CARB and, e and CEC are moving forward with the grant execution pro process. The projects are expected to begin work by the end of the year. Hi, April. Sorry to interrupt. Um, just a reminder to speak slowly. Uh, so that the interpreters, uh, Spanish interpreters, have time to to interpret everything. Thanks. As HFIP enters its 14th year, the project continues to adapt to changing needs. This year, HFIP continues strengthening its focus on supporting underserved fleets. Roughly 750 small fleets participated in HFIP in the last year which is up from 15% from the previous year. As of today, HVIP has about $145 million in available funds. Over the program's life, 12,000 vehicles have been funded with almost 2,000 fleets participating. There will be no additional funding allocations to HVIP for fiscal year 24-25 due to limited available funding available in the budget and the needs in other project categories are higher. HVIP funds are expected to be exhausted by late 2024 or early 2025. This year, we are proposing a review of voucher amounts, including evaluating voucher amounts and simplifying voucher calculations. 
In addition, we are evaluating the potential introduction of a manufacturer's suggested retail price cap or MSRP cap. Also, CARB will explore a potential revamp of the voucher process whereby fleets would be given a voucher redemption certificate that they could use to shop for a vehicle that meets their needs. The Zero Emission School Bus and Infrastructure Project, or ZESB, is a dedicated funding opportunity within HFIP that helps local education agencies replace older internal combustion engine school buses with new zero emission school buses and their accompanying infrastructure. ZESB is a joint effort between CARB and CEC that offers a streamlined approach through one single application process. Last year, CARB received $375 million for the first round of ZESB funding and expects to replace approximately 1,000 old combustion school buses with new zero emission school buses, while CEC receives additional funding to support the installation of charging infrastructure and associated costs. ZESB is now accepting, accepting applications for the first round of funding and is expected to close on September 30th, 2024. These funds will help reduce children's exposure to toxic diesel exhaust and support the goals of recent legislation that require all new school bus purchases to be zero emission by 2035. While there is no new funding appropriated for fiscal year 24-25, the legislature has indicated it intends to provide funding for ZESB in fiscal year 25-26. The Innovative Small E-Fleet Pilot Project, or ICEF for short, offers vouchers for small fleets to access zero emission technologies. ICEF encourages innovative options such as all-inclusive leases, peer-to-peer -peer truck sharing, as-a-service models, and other innovative mechanisms. As of July 2024, there was approximately $24 million available in ICEF. The current proposal for this year's funding plan is to allocate an additional $14.97 million of the AQIP appropriation to continue to support innovative projects. Over the last year, staff has explored new solutions to barriers small fleets face when adopting zero emission technology, such as access to insurance for heavy duty ZEVs and how to potentially provide advanced fleet management services for when an entity incorporates a ZEV into their fleet. In addition, <clears throat> in addition staff is proposing to begin exploring the design of a used truck voucher pilot concept for this fiscal year 24-25. The proposal would leverage and build upon the broad portfolio of creative, innovative solutions already available in ISF. A used voucher program could help foster the market by reducing costs and increasing the supply of vehicles. It would also allow CARB to collect value, valuable information to understand challenges as the market develops and to also inform future policies. We would be careful not to create a program that would inflate the prices. We do intend to hold future meetings to discuss details about new projects ISEF could fund, such as the insurance idea, the advanced fleet management, the advanced management fleet assistance, and dedicated meetings specifically for the used vehicle voucher project. Now, a little overview about the California Off-Road Equipment Project, or CORE. The program is First Come, First Serve system. CORE is intended to accelerate the deployment of advanced zero emission technology in the off-road sector by providing streamlined way for fleets to access funding, which will help offset the incremental cost of advanced zero emission technology, such as forklifts, transportation, transport refrigeration units, and construction and agricultural equipment. 
core targets pre-commercial ready projects which have not yet achieved a significant market foothold. This program allows stacking, which means you can use funding from this program and other incentive programs, but will still need to follow the incentive rules for each. Also, CORE does not require scrappage. Additionally, CORE has enhancements for infrastructure, small business, and operations in disadvantaged communities. Staff recommends that CORE receive $14.9 million in AQIP funds this year. We plan on using those funds for small businesses only. Staff is proposing to conclude incentives for mature zero emission off-road terminal tractors used at freight facilities and shift all funding requests to scrap and replace incentive programs, such as the Carl Moyer Program and Community Air Protection Program. In the future, as terminal tractors with higher gross combined weight rating, greater than 81,000 pounds become available, we would evaluate core incentives eligibility and support future CARB cargo handling equipment regulatory requirements. In lieu of a zero emission off-road certification, we plan to streamline and strengthen the core equipment eligibility process. The zero emission truck loan pilot program opened in May of this year and was allocated $5 million in fiscal year 22-23. Staff have also identified and transferred about $4 million in unused truck loan program funds to augment this program. Staff is recommending a $5 million allocation from AQIP this year. We estimate this amount will support approximately 200 to 300 additional loans, depending on the financed amount. This program is open to small fleets of 20 vehicles or less. It includes all class 2B and greater new or used on-road zero emission vehicles with a gross vehicle weight rating over 8,500 pounds, to apply to the program, an individual small fleet should contact a participating lender. The lender submits the required paperwork directly to the administrator. With these funds available, lenders are better equipped to lend to businesses that need a little extra assistance and typically offer more favorable terms than businesses would otherwise qualify for. CARB is also working closely with the California Energy Commission to align accompanying infrastructure loan support programs, and Southern California Edison has also funded a similar loan support program for customers in its service territory. CalFleet Advisor is a free technical assistance program that was launched last summer to help owners and operators of medium and heavy duty vehicles as they move to zero emission technology. The program has assisted over 600 fleets to date with almost half of participants identifying as drayage fleets. About one third of participants own just one vehicle and half are fleets of 10 or less. While the program is open to all, staff is targeting outreach towards small fleets who face the greatest barriers to zero emission vehicle adoption. Participants can expect personalized assistance through the following ways. A dedicated personal advisor who will provide specific insights into vehicle options, charging infrastructure, fuel savings, applying to funding programs, and more. Important resources and referrals to local utilities, local agencies, dealers, and service providers. Bilingual staff proficient in both English and Spanish. Assistance with one-off questions without the need to enroll in the program. And in the newest development to the program, a whole new CalFleet advisor team has been trained to assist school bus fleets as they seek zero emission options. Although advisors can point participants to public resources, they are not available to assist with compliance training or compliance planning or answering detailed compliance questions about CARB regulations. Those questions are referred to CARB staff. 
<clears throat> CARB has been implementing various workforce training and development efforts to support the recommenda recommendations outlined in Senate Bill 350, Low Income Barrier Guidance Document, and Component CARB's Clean Mobility and Other Clean Transportation Investments. CARB is addressing workforce gaps in priority populations by collaborating across state agencies and with other partners to co-fund community-driven projects. To date, we have allocated a total of $4.575 million to workforce training and development projects. CARB collaborated with CEC via an intra-agency agreement to add, additional, add an additional $1 million to their ideal ZEV workforce solicitation that is now implementing 13 projects. CARB released the solicitation for adult, vocation, adult and vocation school ZEV training projects in the amount of $1.5 million and is currently in the process of executing those agreements with the grantees. CARB is collaborating with the Foundation for California Community Colleges on approximately $2 million project to expand equitable access and support the investments of college ZEV training programs for priority populations. Additionally, CARB's Clean Mobility Investment and Advanced Technology Demonstration and Pilot Projects generally incorporate elements that help to further support and prioritize workforce training and development. Finally, pursuant to Assembly Bill 794, a fleet purchaser of new drayage, short haul trucks and on-road terminal tractors must attest that it does not have any applicable law violation at the time of applying for incentive is remaining in compliance with applicable laws for the duration of the incentive agreement and attests that it will retain direct control over the manner and means for performance of any individual using or driving the vehicle. Attestations must be renewed annually while participating in the incentive program. Failure to do so will result in ineligibility to participate in the incentive program. Complaints against fleets alleging labor law violations or false attestations can be filed online and will be investigated and referred to the state labor law agencies as appropriate. Now I'll hand this over to my colleague Amrit, who is going to facilitate questions or comments on the medium and heavy duty vehicle and on and off road equipment investments. Thank you, April. Uh, we are now opening the floor for questions and comments about this part of the presentation. Um, again, to ask questions or make a comment, if you are on Zoom desktop, click raise hand under the participants tab. If you are on Zoom through your mobile phone, tap raise hand in the more tab. If you're calling in through your phone, press star two to raise your hand. You can also email questions to cleantransportationincentives at arb.ca.gov. And I believe this email address was posted in the chat, but we can drop it in again. Once your line is open, please state your name and affiliation, if any, before speaking. And if you are emailing, if you're emailing us, our email monitor will notify us of your questions. All right, so I'll start off with the first raised hand by Bill McGavern. Bill, uh, we have unmuted your line. You are free to speak. Please remember to state your name and affiliation, if any. Thank you very much. This is Bill McGavern representing the Coalition for Clean Air and just wanted to make uh, a few broad comments in support of the directions that you're taking. We support the focus on small fleets uh, because those are the ones that should be prioritized, the ones that need the most help in making this transition. And uh, we know that when it comes for trucks that those smaller fleets are not affected by the advanced clean fleets rule. So we will get the greatest gains in air quality by replacing dirty older trucks um, in that sector with zero emission trucks. Um, because of the fact that the, the funding will be running out, uh, unfortunately, the, the legislature and the governor did not prioritize this sector for funding. 
in the budget. I think it makes it all the more important that low carbon fuel standard credits be used for incentives in medium and heavy duty. And that's something we're supporting in the LCFS amendment process. And uh, finally, uh, we also support the implementation of the labor standards um, through uh, 794, which we supported when it was in the legislature. We wanna make sure that um, no company that is engaging in misclassification is benefiting from public funds. So uh, thank you for your workshop today. Thanks thank for you your Bill. comments, Bill. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Amrit. You're good. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Uh, our next raised hand is from Maya Inigo Anderson. You have been unmuted and you are free to speak. Please remember to state your name and affiliation, if any. Hi, good morning. Maya with Communities for a Better Environment and the Charge Ahead Initiative. I want to first off thank CARB staff for hosting this workshop and for operating these important clean air programs. I also want to thank Bill for his important comment about the need to get the oldest and dirtiest trucks off the road and in support of implementing labor standards. I have two quick questions. Um, Charge Ahead believes that given the limited funding, CARB should prioritize heavy duty and medium duty programs that benefit small fleets and businesses. Uh, so question one, is there flexibility to shift other funds to programs like ISEF that um, benefit small fleets? And secondly, um, I didn't want to hog the mic earlier, uh, but during the light duty presentation, I uh, also wanted to share the importance of a ticker or some kind of more easily accessible information on how much of the clean transportation program funding has already been spent and what's still available. Um, for example, um, when I go to the annual report, um, there are uh, some links from the annual report that I'm actually not able to open. Um, so I don't know if that's a technical issue on the car end or on my end, um, but it's really hard to find readily available information on how much has been spent in these important light duty uh, clean transportation programs and what's still available. And obviously as an environmental justice advocate, I wanna help advocate for adequate funding for these programs, but that's easier to do when we know it's available. Um, thanks again for your time. Hi, Maya, I, I can take the first question. Um, so we have limited funding as you've heard from this workshop. Um, the only funding we have this year is from our AQIP fund. Um, and we are splitting that money. Um, so ISEP is getting half of that or a $14 million of that money. And then um, some of the money is going to the truck loan program and then also to the core program. And then I'm not sure who wants to handle the life duty question. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for your um, comments and questions. And um, I'm still trying to, there go, I don't know what's happening with the, the camera button. I apologize. Um, while we're, uh, oh, okay. I was thinking we needed someone to answer the ticker question, but it sounds like, um, right, we did kind of answer that previously. So I, I think that should be okay. Um, and then as far as, um, the you're saying about the the annual report um maybe we could discuss later uh because i had questions about whether that was in the draft funding plan or that's like the website that you're not able to access when you just you know go to the internet and search and it, it sounds like when you mentioned the annual report you're talking about the maybe the california climate investments annual report um so we could talk offline about um exactly where where the issues are and and figure out um, a resolution okay thank you Stephanie you're welcome okay, I think I could hand it back to Amrit uh, to take the next question thank you Stephanie <clears throat> uh, the next raised hand is from Glenn Cho you have been unmuted uh, you're free to speak please remember to state your name and affiliation if any 
Thank you. Uh, Glenn Cho from Toyota Motors North America. Um, I had a question on your HBIT slide about the consideration of manufacturers retail price cap. Uh, I just two questions. One is how would you, if you are going to do, how would you implement this given the fact that you have different class sizes within the, the mean duty, heavy duty uh, sector? And then as well, different technologies, whether it's battery, plug-in hybrid, or that of fuel cell. And then second question is, if you do have an MSRP cap, would this cap be applied to other mean duty, heavy duty incentive programs like you're talking about today? There, Glenn, this is Young Tran. Um, so for that MSRP cap, um, sorry, the the first part about how was it about how to implement? Exactly. How would you do it given the different uh you know class sizes and, and each of those class sizes would have also a, a different uh price segments and likewise uh, depending on other features in the trucks, uh prices will vary significantly even within the class. Absolutely. Um, so I think part of that is obtaining uh, those data from the manufacturers. So that's where we're going to start. Um, this is a process that uh, we are currently working on and we will be releasing soon, actually starting with class eight vehicles. So that's a little bit of a preview. So we are looking at one, gathering that data. And um, part of that process, I think, will be helpful to get information from the manufacturers themselves. So are you, did you mention you are with uh, a specific, you are a manufacturer? We're a powertrain provider. We're with we're Toyota Motors North America. We don't manufacture mean duty, heavy duty uh, trucks, but we are a powertrain provider. So the pricing would have to come from the OEMs, not from yeah. us. But uh, we're just wondering how you guys would implement this uh, is kind of the question mark I had. Yeah, I, I think it's not going to be, it's going to be a, Few years in the in the process, so uh, that is um, something that we're looking to get those comments uh, from you, uh, from you all, and from the the manufacturers. But initially, we're trying to get that data now. Um, and then, as far as for your second comment, what or your uh, second question? Yeah, with this type of MSRP cap, would it be basically applied to other incentive initiatives that you have today, like um, the small manufacturers or small fleets and, and the school buses and whatnot? I mean, so we're just wondering, uh, it, would this cap be applied to other incentive programs uh, that CARB has for both mean duty and heavy duty applications? Uh, so for now, I, the idea is, is specifically just to HBIP. So, like you mentioned, for class two through to eight. Um, I'd like to throw in one thing, just a reminder to folks that the innovative small e-fleet program does in general follow HVIP rules. So it's it is it is possible that it would apply. In fact, I think it's probable that it would apply to ISEF. I can't speak to some of the others, but uh, again, really ISEF is just a subset of HVIP with some specific rules for itself. You said thank you. Right. And and I'll add to, I mean, part of it, and I don't remember if that was in the, the slide. I was having some issues with my my um slides and the presentation. Um, but as for HVIP, as we mentioned, it's it's been around for a long time. And so let's say, okay, I'll start with this. We, as the scale and market adoption and, you know, more manufacturers come online, we're, what we're seeing, the trends is that the cost should be coming down over time. Um, so that's part of where we want to introduce this concept and start that conversation and then start gathering that data from these, uh, from the OEMs. You know, with more scale. Battery prices should be coming down. Component pieces should be coming down. So um, that's what we're want to initiate that conversation. Does that help? Yes, sir. It does. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Next question is from Alchemy Graham. You have been unmuted and you're free to speak. Please remember to state your name and affiliation, if any. Yes, thank you. Good morning. Um, Alchemy Graham on behalf of the California Transit Association. Uh, as you know, our member agencies are mandated by the ICT to transition fully to zero emission vehicles. And normally, our agencies rely on the HBIP to provide significant financial assistance when procuring their zero emission heavy duty vehicles. But as uh, the demand for these vehicles continues to grow, agencies are finding that breast procurements have become more and more expensive. Uh, and so, <clears throat> excuse me, because HBIP voucher amounts have remained fairly stable despite the higher vehicle prices, our member agencies are struggling to procure the necessary vehicles to fulfill those same ICT requirements. And so I just want to thank CARB for its ongoing support to pro provided to transit agencies throughout the transition to zero emission fleets, and also want to respectfully urge CARB to continue the support by increasing voucher amounts in alignment with those rising vehicle prices. Uh, we look forward to working with you on this issue in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comment. Uh, next raised hand is from Laura Renger. We have unmuted your line and you are free to speak. Please remember to state your name and affiliation, if any. Hi, thank you, Laura Renger from Cali TC. Um, I first just wanted to, you know, support the proposals. Um, you know, we really appreciate what you're doing in this space with a very limited budget. Um, also, just encourage continual collaboration amongst all of the groups within CARB, um, especially thinking about the edits that are being made to the low carbon fuel standard and funding options. Um, you know, I think that we're in a spot where there's a number of us that are very concerned that there isn't a funding source readily um, identifiable in the future for medium and heavy duty uh, vehicles, especially with some potential changes that may happen. So, um, yes, just encourage, uh, continual collaboration and thanks again for all your efforts here. Thank you so much, Laura. All right. Our next raised hand is from Lisa McGee. Lisa? We have unmuted you. You are free to speak. Please remember to state your name and affiliation, if any. Hi, it's Lisa McGee, Tom Struck Center. Um, so I just wanted to kind of focus on some of the exploring ideas and some of the facts in the program. I do agree with uh, CARB that we will definitely be out of money by the end of this year, given that our burn rate is already pretty much at where we were last year in terms of close to an annual of 2000 vouchers per year. Um, and, and I don't know if we can do anything about the redemption process, not only from the dealer side, but also on the on on the deliverable side. You know, we're only averaging 35% of redeemed vehicles in the whole program since 20, 2010. And it's even slowed down over the last two years. So I'm not sure if there's something for us to focus on on as we move this project forward to really to really um, have an impact um, for the community and to set the goals. Um, and regarding exploring the program on used trucks, I would like to make sure and just kind of comment that, you know, you guys uh, introduced the Zero Emission Powertrain Certification Program in 2019 for a specific purpose to make sure the fleets have confidence in the technology. So I wanna make sure that as we move forward into other ideas to, um, benefit um, affordability that these programs will also manage what that equipment is in terms of its useful life its support and services and and so forth so not sure if you guys have thought that through or not um but i do i do like the idea i just want to make sure that we've got a program and it supports everyone fairly if they've got a certification program or if they've got a cert um they should be in the program and be another choice for us and on the small fleets, I want to comment that why don't we explore aligning this with the Caramora proposal um, that's going before the board in October that does include taxes and insurance for the small size fleets. Um, that could be something that we could explore in HFIP as well as 100% rebate um, when they're in a disadvantaged community. Um, I think I'd like to see that. I think we're really just struggling 
when you add up tax and federal excise tax, you can be well out the door with DMVs still at $170,000, even if they owe only 10% on the truck. It's still more than sometimes a class eight truck. So in the real world, this has big impacts and that doesn't even include insurance yet, doesn't include the charging aspects of it. Parking agreements are a big, big, big issue that we do need to explore immediately. We've got issues that don't allow these independent owner operators that are largely our small size fleets um, that cannot qualify um, based on the current implementation program, which requires HFIP small size fleets um, to have a one, I think, or three, or I'm not sure which it is today, um, agreement for parking or lease. Um, in the real world for these small operators, they don't really sign commercial leases with brick and mortar. They just have a parking agreement that might be month to month. And furthermore, they cannot come up with a utility agreement um, that is part of your review process to tie the business name. So I just think it's time that we start shifting to help the small fleet programs be successful. Um, they just don't have utility agreements for the same reason. They're not the commercial lease tenant, nor are they the owner of the property. Um, and then moving on to rentals, um, we've got a great program in your ISIF, ISIF um, funding. And it's just not obviously getting used, I think, as it's been intended to um, be set aside for this use. And um, my comments are is that, you know, I'm trying to explore how we could do a better job now that we're kind of exploring how these policies can, can work um, from lessons learned. And California Vehicle Code 27900 um, doesn't require a rental under 30 days or less to have any type of authority. Um, including any type of DMV registration. So I'm not sure why CARB would, one, increase the fleet size from a try before you buy a program for rentals. Um, it, kind of, it kind of just sometimes can create an issue all by itself. Um, I think that should be explored and um, not increase the fleet size. In addition to that, the VPC portal does not support submitting um, two different types of vehicles in one order. Therefore, even if you as a dealer submit for one order, um, I might have a fuel cell and a BEV in one order for my customer, but because the VPC doesn't allow the dealer to submit uh, those two different vehicle types in one order, we have to split it. And based on the IM and the feedback we're getting from uh, staff is that because that one order that was in front of it is now an unredeemed voucher, it's counting against it in a fleet size for someone that's got 20 trucks, they're now, they now can't have that second vehicle. Um, but just because the fleet pro or the VPC program has an issue, it doesn't seem reasonable to hold um, one fleet um, that is entitled to a benefit to not have a benefit. And um, I have two more comments, redemption timeline. Um, it's, we're averaging, it's, it's, it, I, for one month, I thought it was getting better and it really was. Now we're at more like three to six months and we're really good at pretty much being on top of this process. I'm concerned that it's, ex, it's going to definitely exclude fleets from, or de dealers from participating. They can't afford this, um, to take three and six months. They can't absorb the floor interest rate. Um, they're handing over titles of a truck, um, worth half of a million dollars. Um, and it's taking us after we deliver it four to six months to get paid, but there's a lot of risk um, and, and businesses just can't afford that. Even medium to larger size businesses can't afford millions of dollars that you're waiting for on rebates. Um, I'd like to see us flip the process to, so that you can have clawback all the time. Um, and last but not least on the core program, I'd like to see on the true refer equipment that we allow um, install costs and then when you are doing the rebates to make sure we're following a cost effectiveness associated with the kilowatt hours. I'm seeing 10 kilowatt hours and 60 kilowatt hours at completely different price points. And I'd like to see that better aligned. And thank you. So I keep turning my camera off and on, I'm sorry. Uh, Lisa, I'll, I'll grab most of those and we, or, well, at least some of the ones that we can answer here. Uh, obviously, any comments that we get in, we, you know, we always consider. Um, I did want to mention uh, uh, two or three things, though. Uh, I'm sorry, let me see here. I'm just going back to my notes. 
so one of the things is, you know, you talked about uh, taxes and, and other fees and so forth in alignment with, with Moyer, certainly something that we consider within the program. I mean, obviously we want to get as many vehicles in the hands of small fleets as possible, but we do realize that, uh, yes, taxes can be, uh, can be quite expensive. Um, let me see here. You mentioned the, uh, the used voucher program that we're thinking about, and we're very, very, very much early in that process. Uh, absolutely, we recognize that thinking it through very carefully is critical. There are a lot of things that uh, we want to make sure don't happen, uh, you know, in inadvertently. Uh, as, and I, as I said, we're just in the very, very early stages of that, and we uh, uh, will be workshopping that separately. So as we develop, as probably some of the other things that we mentioned in the, in the possible ISEF uh, expansions to the program, but we'll certainly be workshopping that heavily, talking to people like yourselves, uh, you know, just industry in general to see things such as, you know, making sure that useful life is still there, making sure that battery health is good, whatever the case is. So certainly we are not, uh, yeah, we're not ignoring that. And I also just briefly wanted to, uh, uh, um, address the issue of uh of multiple of multiple vehicle types on a voucher first of all i do want to point out that actually in the hvip inm and it's the language is, it needs to be clarified granted it does say that it includes a quantity of more than one so one batch one voucher submittal uh if it's for more than one vehicle um it's with the same purchaser vehicle or domicile address so i mean it it, it actually isn't just it isn't a VPC problem. Um, it's really written into the rules. Now, is that something that we want to look at? Uh, you know, changing in some form or fashion? Yes, absolutely, it is. Um, you know, what what that what that form or fashion be? I don't know. But again, we are aware of that. So, uh, with that, if anyone else had any other answers they want to throw in, I'm going to step offline. Thanks, Bruce. Um, yeah, this is Young again. Uh, thanks, Lisa, for um, those comments. And I reiterate what Bruce is saying. Definitely want to, we're aware of these issues, we're working through them, and um, definitely will be recognizing what you're saying too about the domicile issues. Um, and with these, you know, focusing on small fleets, we're going to be um, working with you and other dealers on that, along with the fleets. Um, so that's that part. On, um, I think you had a comment about the um, redemptions, and so I, on that note, I would say that uh, I forgot exactly when it was, but there were we had some average trends that we've seen a. Um, pretty significant increase on redemptions. So I think that's good news, but also I think there was a record month. Um, I wanna say it was like April or May or something like that, where we had, you know, very high record redemption of 20, don't quote me, but I wanna say it was like in the mid 20 million for that month. So that was um, a good thing. And I think those are the comments that I had down. Oh, I think you had also a comment about core. Um, so yes, appreciate that. Um, we'll t I'll take that back with the um, team and uh, have to take that in consideration regarding the kilowatt hours. Thank you, everyone. Uh, our next raise hand is from Erica Baker. Erica, you have been unmuted uh, and you're free to speak. Please remember to state your name and affiliation, if any. Hi, this is Erica Baker with Green Power Motor Company. Can you please just confirm that staff is proposing not to allocate any funding to standard HVIP in fiscal year 24-25? And if that is the case, are there plans to replenish the funds in fiscal year 25-26, or do you foresee that standard H could be eliminated? Uh, 
Yep. Right. So based on our request rate, we're anticipating that um, HBIP funds would be exhausted by the end of 2024 or early 2025. Um, and in anticipation of that, we will have a contingency um, wait list. Um, now, I think I heard you say, will there Will the fund will the pro project be eliminated? Um, the answer to that's no. We are still implementing um, all the grant agreements and voucher redemption processing um, that will be ongoing for quite some time. Um, but I think, as you may have heard quite a bit already today, there's no new funding. Um, or there's limited funding, um, but specific to HVIP, uh, there's no new funding being allocated. And part of that is um, to get new funding is going through other channels outside of CARBS control, meaning through the legislature. Thank you. And we have a raised hand from Jacqueline Moore. Uh, Jacqueline, you have been unmuted. You are free to speak. Please remember to state your name and affiliation, if any. Hello, thank you so much for holding this opportunity to provide public comment. My name is Jacqueline Moore. I'm from the Pacific Merchant Shipping Association, PMSA, and I represent the folks that operate along uh, the West Coast at the various ports. Um, I specifically wanted to comment on the core program, so the off-road equipment. Um, I recognize that there's very limited funding, as we're seeing for many different programs, um, and that CARB is proposing that it be accessible only towards small businesses. And while I can appreciate due to limited funding, I do implore you not to limit it just to small businesses, but potentially allocate a, a certain percentage, whether that's large. Um, there's also the proposal to remove terminal tractors um, as the workforces at the ports. It's uh, it, it would be a detriment to the transformation to zero emissions. So um, keeping those in as an eligible category would be um, uh, much appreciated. Uh, in the draft plan, it does say the higher weight capacity terminals may be eligible. Um, so as we're thinking along those lines, um, um, please uh, keep the ports and the rail yards in your mind to keep those uh, categories as eligible. Um, you're also proposing um, greater voucher uh, amounts for large capacity forklifts, which we um, very much support. Uh, they're very uh, uh, heavy piece of equipment, very expensive. So um, increasing the voucher amounts are also very much appreciated. Um, I'll, I have some other more detailed comments that I will submit to staff during the formal comment period when we actually um, see the full proposed draft uh, uh, funding plan, but just wanted to highlight some of those uh, main comments and again, say thank you for holding this uh, second workshop, I believe it is, um, providing the public uh, an opportunity to um, share our thoughts. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your comment. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to say thank you, Jacqueline. We'll look forward to getting those comments from you. Thank you. Uh, that is the last of the raised hands. Uh, I just want to double check. We don't have any questions um, on our on our email. And actually, we do have another raised hand uh, just now. From Mike Bullock. Mike, you have been unmuted. Uh, you are free to speak. Uh, please remember to state your name and affiliation, if any. Yeah, hello, uh, Mike Bullock. Uh, thank you for uh, letting me speak. Uh, yeah, I wanna talk about the uh, medium duty, heavy duty uh, incentives. Um, and uh, one thing is to understand that uh, not only do we need um, electrification as fast as we can get it, but the CARB scoping plan makes it very clear that we also need to reduce vehicle miles traveled. And uh, the scoping plan uh, uh, quantifies that. Uh, 
at least for light duty vehicles, it says we need a 25% uh, driving reduction. So I think uh, we can um, understand that we need to also reduce uh, the use of, uh, of trucks and uh, uh, incentivize uh, people who want to haul freight to do that on a rail, it would be much more efficient or, or figure out um, other ways to do their business where they're not uh, uh, racking up huge mileage uh, in trucks. Um, and one thing that's important, and I go back to the carb scoping plan, that is the California official plan to achieve our official SB uh, 32 uh, climate mandate. Uh, and so uh, as, um, Kamala Harris established when she was AG. She joined a lawsuit down here uh, where I live uh, in Oceanside. Uh, she joined a lawsuit against the San Diego Association of Governments, something that um, uh, Attorney General Brown would not do in 2007. I guess he knew his place. Uh, she also knew her place, and it was to do her job, even though she made her very, very unpopular back in 2011. But she uh, uh, accomplished this uh, legal principle is that no project can ignore uh, the CARB scoping plan. So that's a huge win for CARB, although CARB doesn't uh, tell anybody about that uh, or maybe doesn't even understand uh, that uh, court rulings uh, that uh, the attorney general accomplished. Uh, but anyway, uh, the CARB scoping plan tells us that pricing is essential, okay? Pricing is essential. And, um, to reduce vehicle miles traveled, but pricing is a pretty good idea anyway. The reason it's essential is because you have to do a lot in a short period of time. Everybody knows we live and die by 2030. That's the first thing we think of in the morning, the last thing we think of at night, because human survival is that important. And uh, to uh, paraphrase uh, Kamala Harris's first threatening lawsuit <laughs> to, to Sandag, she said, uh, you can't ignore the carb scoping plan, its official plan, because it's about climate stabilization, which is the objective of uh, CEQA. Now, that was an exaggeration. Of course, there's lots of uh, objectives, but uh, there was a purpose for her to uh, uh, make that exaggeration and make that statement. Uh, nothing is more important. And so what I'm leading up to is the road use charge and the fact that we need to replace the California gasoline tax because it's extremely regressive, very unfair to uh, low income drivers, especially, uh, but it takes away um, free choice and it's just a terribly, uh, it's just a terrible idea, the gasoline tax. It needs to be replaced by a, a uh, means-based, means-based road use charge. So I don't know how that works out with trucks, you know, our trucks, uh, low income, high income. I mean, the, it doesn't matter if the corporation's making a lot of money or not very much money. I mean, I, I don't know how that, uh, there's all sorts of questions about the road use charge. It's just that we need to do a really good one. It needs to do a lot of things. And uh, the primary thing it needs to do is be uh, means-based. And also, it needs to be value-priced. In other words, we shouldn't be uh, taking money from education, home, homelessness, and you know the long list of things which are appropriate for general fund taxes and instead make it artificially to drive. That is, uh, the, that is why uh, we're probably going to fail in California and why we're going to fail uh, around the world in 2030s too soon. And the CARB shows us how we could do it, but nobody pays any attention to CARB. Uh, there's that scoping plan. Uh, Kamala Harris uh, called it out for what it is and said you can't ignore it, but um, she's no longer in, uh, she's no longer our, ten, our attorney general, uh, sadly. Uh, we don't have an attorney general that uh, sees the world accurately as uh, Kamala Harris happened to do. Uh, and uh, so anyway, we we need a good road use charge and CARB should be pushing that very hard uh, if they care about uh, SB 32 achieving the climate mandate. And beyond that, maybe they're just human beings. Maybe in other words, what I'm saying is maybe they care about survival. Maybe they care about avoiding destabilization. We're on that path. The uh, attorney general I'm sorry, the Secretary General of the UN has said we're dangerously close to the point of no return. Point of no return, what's he talking about? He also made this statement, we are uh, driving towards climate hell with our foot on the accelerator. So um, anyway, that's 
the situation I wanted to uh, point out that uh, CARB needs to be uh, pushing this, uh, replacing the, the California gasoline tax with the California road use charge, which would be means based, would do a lot of things, would reduce driving, would reduce trucking, and uh, would give us uh, a chance. And CARB also needs to be telling the world about their own scoping plan uh, that is this is a carb meeting i guess and uh, so carb uh, top to bottom needs to be um, begging people to remember those legal rulings that obtained by the attorney general although not easy uh, you know every <laughs> and I, just, I, I just wanted to uh, jump in I, oh. I just wanted to jump in and ask you to wrap up in about in about 15 to 30 seconds so that we have time for other comments okay thank, thank you very, very much, much. And, and you know you've been very generous with your time and of um, course I, I got on here a little late and i'm not prepared so i, I hope it didn't ramble too much but uh, it just just wrapping up uh it, you, we need to disincentivize uh, uh, truck driving and the, the use of trucks and the road use charge is the key and, and uh, carb scoping plan is uh, should be something that we uh, we we comply with, uh, you, you know, whether it's a climate action plan or it's a general plan update of any kind or regional transportation plan, um, CARB should be demanding that uh, the um, the rulings uh, that were obtained by the attorney general uh, be recognized and they can't they should not be ignoring it and uh, so there's pricing of car parking i didn't get into that car that pricing of road use those are the two pricing things and and then there's a mass transit thing but you know that was about uh, light vehicles but uh, that pricing carries over into the uh, the heavy medium uh, size trucks and uh, heavy heavy duty trucks and how we ship trip freight. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, thank you, Mike, for your comments. And thank you, Amrit, for um, managing the Q&A session. Um, so we are now at the end of our time for um, this Q&A session. Um, I think we don't see, oh, I should have let Amrit do this. Sorry, Amrit. Uh, I don't see any other hands raised and it doesn't sound like we have any questions that um, have come through on the email. So thanks for all of your questions and comments. And we'll now spend just a little bit of time to go over next steps in the funding plan development process. So today we heard about and discussed information regarding the funding plan and uh, the funding that was appropriated to CARB in the fiscal year 2024-25 state budget. And we also heard from our lead staff on light duty mobility, as well as medium and heavy duty incentive projects uh, regarding the draft funding plan allocations and the policy changes um, or draft policy changes for some of our incentive projects. Um, and then we were also able to listen to your comments and questions, and we appreciate um, those discussions. Thank you for your feedback today, and we'll take the information we've heard and consider whether we can incorporate it um, into the incentive projects and the funding plan. So now we'll revisit the funding plan development schedule. I'd like to remind you of important dates in the development of the funding plan. CARB staff plans to post the proposed funding plan online on October 11th for a formal 30-day public comment period. During this time, we'll continue to hold monthly evening community meetings as we collaborate on the funding plan. Note that evening community meetings are held on the third Tuesday of every month from 5 to 7 p.m except for November due to the November 21st CARB board hearing. To close out our meeting, I'll wrap up with our contact slide. I wanna remind you of our open door policy, especially for those most affected by our incentive projects. We encourage you to contact us for one-on-one -on -one discussions about your concerns and solutions. Use the team email address shown on the slide, clean transportation incentives at arb.ca.gov. 
which was, will also be shared in the chat. Thank you for collaborating with us on the funding plan. And to stay up to date, please subscribe to our listserv. The link will also be provided in the chat. It's been a pleasure to facilitate today's meeting. Have a great day.